Today we're going into Nahum chapter number three. It's another short chapter broken up into two other views of, of the destruction of Nineveh. I find it ironic, I find it fascinating that, that he would have four separate views or four separate prophecies about this destruction. Shows it from a different standpoint each time. Last week we looked at their power and that their commercialism would be, would be taken down. And today we're going to be looking at something they had in common with a couple other great cities or bloody cities. It would be their idolatry. So that, that's the gist of, of the beginning of chapter 3. And then, then from chapters, uh, uh, from verses 8 through the end, uh, deal with, with power once again. And, and uh, you know, the Egyptians thought they were strong, but yet they fell. You know, and later on we would have the Babylonians after, uh, or the, the, the Babylonians after the, after the uh, uh, Assyrians, and uh, they fell. But they're coming back and they'll fall again. That's God's promise for that. So, so we'll, get, we'll pick it up by, by reading through Nahum chapter 3 and then going back to verse number 1. Nahum chapter 3 says, Woe to the bloody city! It is full of lies and robbery. The prey departeth not. The noise of a whip and the noise of the rattling of the wheels and of the prancing horses and of the jumping chariots. The horsemen lifted up both the bright sword and the glittering spear, and there is a multitude of slain and a great number of carcasses, and there is none end of their corpses. They stumble upon their corpses because of the multitude of the whoredoms of the well-favored harlot, the mistress of witchcrafts that selleth nations through her whoredoms and families through her witchcrafts. Behold, I am against thee, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will discover thy skirts upon thy face, and I will show, show the nations thy nakedness and the kingdoms thy shame, and I will cast abominable filth upon thee and make thee vile and will, and will set thee as a gazing stock. And it shall come to pass that all they that look upon thee shall flee from thee and say, Nineveh, is laid waste. Who will bemoan her? Whence shall I seek comforters for thee? Art thou better than populous No, that was situate among the rivers that had the waters round about it, whose rampart was the sea, and her wall was from the sea? Ethiopia and Egypt were her strength, and it was infinite. Put and Labum were, were thy helpers. Yet, was she carried away? She went into captivity. Her young children also were dashed in pieces at the top of all the streets. And they cast, they cast lots for her honorable men. And all her great men were bound in chains. Thou also shalt be drunken. Thou shalt be hid. Thou shalt also seek strength because of the enemy. All thy strongholds shall be like fig trees with the first ripe figs. If they be shaken, they shall even fall into the mouth of the, of the eaters. Behold, thy people in the midst of thee are women. The gates of thy land shall be set wide open unto thine enemies. The fire shall devour thy bars. Draw thee waters for the siege. Fortify the strongholds. Go into clay and tread the, the mortar. Make strong the, the brickland. There shall be the fire devour thee. There shall the fire devour thee. The sword shall cut thee off. It shall eat thee up like canker worm. Make thyself many as the canker worm. Make thyself many as the locusts. Thou hast multiplied thy merchants above the stars of heaven. The canker worm spoileth and fleeth away. Thy crown are as the, as the locusts and thy captains as the great grasshoppers which camp in the hedges in the, in the cold day. But when the sun ariseth, they flee away, and felt their place is not known where they are. Thy shepherds slumber, O king of Assyria. Thy nobles shall dwell in the, land, in the dust. Thy people is scattered upon the mountains, and no man gathereth them. 
There is no healing of thy bruise. Thy wound is, is grievous. All that hear the brute of thee shall clap their hands over thee, for upon whom hath not thy wickedness passed continually? And may the Lord add his blessing to his word this morning. Amen. What's well, interesting, as I've been repeating over and over again, this, this, this book, this prophecy of Nahum, it, it's so intriguing. It's, uh, it's like that, uh, that play by play of what's coming. So it's hard to, to uh, interpret. It goes in and out of, of uh, dealing with Assyria, dealing with Egypt, dealing with uh, Judah and Israel. And so it, it's tough to follow in places. Like even as we were reading chapter 3, how many times did you see the canker worm and the locust? And what are those pictures of? Those are pictures of, of, of the Babylonian captivity and, and also the day of the Lord and found in the book of Joel. So there's a lot going on. So it, it's really hard to, be, uh, to condense it into one thing. It plays out, out among a space of about 185 years as well. So there are different kings in play, kings of Judah, kings of Israel, and kings of Assyria as well. So it's difficult, but when you look at it and look at it as a whole, I think here's the greatest thing you find is that through the whole book, you find God's mercy to his people and his destruction upon those who, who are not his people. Who, are the, who have turned against him. So we'll look at that a little bit today. Back to, to verse number one. I scrolled all the way back to chapter two, so but it's, they're short chapters. Verse number one, woe to the bloody city. That says a lot right there. The bloody city, what is the bloody city? Hmm? Yeah, Chicago. <laughs> yeah, Chicago, D.C., yeah, yeah. Memphis, name them all here. But the bloody city. Uh, this bloody city here, of course, he's talking about Nineveh. But also, there's another city that's called the bloody city as well. And also another one that's one that sheds lots of blood. The bloodshed of the saints was, was caused by that. And they have some similarities. The other bloody city is Jerusalem, it's called the bloody city. Why? Because they committed idolatry. They shed bl the blood of, of, of animals and committed lewdness with, well, not the animals, but with the, with the, uh, the, Id the idols there in, in the land. And, and because of that, because of the nature of idolatry, they committed physical lewdness as well. So we've seen that pattern throughout the years. So the blood is, is, number one, it's the blood because of idolatry, and number two, it's physical blood because of the bloodshed that they, that they all mutually shed in order to prosper. The Assyrians were known as being the most brutal people on the face of the earth. You know, they literally ripped people in two, you know, cut them in half, dragged them off, all, did all kinds of things in order to show their power. And, uh, and cause fear in, in, in the people who they were conquering. And as if there's not enough fear already, you know, when you're being conquered. I think of, I remember a time back, back when I, I went into Mexico and, and visited a, a huge, I mean, we think cath Catholic cathedrals are, are huge here, but they're in these little villages and they're huge monstrosities. And this one we went into uh, was built on, built from the, the stones of a Mayan pyramid that was left. It was creepy. I literally got the creeps when I went inside there. And uh, in there they had the, the preserved remains of all the different bishops from like the 1600s on were in there. But just the fact, you know, even in Mexico, we, we actually were risking our lives. They could have taken and, and thrown us in jail for who knows how long just for being inside that building because you don't dare go in those without proper authority. But, but what I'm getting at is, is they made these, this giant edifice. Why? 
Why did, were these big, huge, scary-looking buildings built by religions? They were to cause fear. They were, they were the gargoyles. Do you ever wonder why there's gargoyles on top of so-called church, churches? Scare. Don't go near here. This is, this is sacred ground. We are the ones that live in these temples, and you obey us. This is the same thing that happened with the idolatry in Israel, the same thing that happened with the idolatry here in Nineveh, and the idolatry in Babylon, so to speak. And everywhere idolatry went, bloodshed and fear went along with it. Let's go over to Ezekiel 22. Ezekiel 22. So we have here in, in Nahum, Nahum 3, verse 1, we find that, that here's the bloody city. It's addressed as the bloody city. But we go over to Ezekiel chapter 22. Ezekiel 22. Ezekiel 22, we'll, we'll try not to read the whole chapter. We'll, we'll go to verse number 1, though. Verse number 1 says, Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Now thou son of man, wilt thou judge? Wilt thou judge the bloody city? Yea, thou shalt show her all her abominations. I'd love to stop right there, but we need to see who this bloody city is that he's talking about here. Then say thou, thus saith the Lord God, the city sheddeth blood in the midst of it, that her time may come and maketh idols against herself to defile herself. So she sheddeth blood in the midst of us. This blood here is the, the shedding of blood of animals for pagan sacrifices, and it can also be the literal shedding of blood, you know, of, of people. Verse number four says, uh, thou, sh thou art become guilty in thy blood that thou hast shed and hast defiled thyself in thine idols, which thou hast made, and thou hast caused thy days to draw near, and art come even unto thy years. Therefore have I made thee a reproach with the heathen and a mocking to all countries. And dare I say this, that this is still in play today. Little, the little tiny nation of Israel is, is a byword. It's hated by almost all countries, especially those around it. And, uh, and, and, but it will come to pass. This was told, told by God. God promised them. This is one of God's promises. He promised them that if they committed idolatry and went the way of the nations, they'd be scattered among the nations. But yet, his promises of, 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 the, of the, the coming kingdom, the Abrahamic covenant, the promises of a, of a king to sit on the throne of David forever are still in play. Never forget those things. While we're still here on earth and, and uh, we... Once we leave in the rapture, after that, all these things will start taking place. The, the, the day of the Lord will, will begin, and, and then we'll, we'll see all the book of Revelation played out before us. I wonder if we were just talking about that the other day, weren't we? Will we see that? It'll be, will it be like a, a projection you know, that we'll see from heaven of the happenings on earth? Will we have a Clarence Larkin timeline come to life? You know, it will, and will we see that? Well, this is that. This is that which was spoken by Daniel. There he is. The Antichrist is going into the temple. All these different things. But yet, Israel, or the Jerusalem, the bloody city. What verse was I on here? All right. Those that be near and those that be far from thee shall mock thee which are infamous and much vexed. What, do we, what happened when the Messiah came to redeem his people? Come down off that cross. You saved others, you can't even save yourself. 
the mockery even from their own people, especially through idolatry, would be, would be the, the, the thing of the nation of Israel. And here, Ezekiel, of course, he's, he's, dur- he's prophesying at the end, just before Judah was taken into captivity and during the captivity itself. That's why the end of the book of uh, Ezekiel is amazing. The promises of the millennial temple, the promises of the, of the kingdom, the promises of, of even the Dead Sea now coming to life are found in the book of Ezekiel. Verse number seven, or six. Behold, the princes of Israel, everyone were in thee to their power to shed blood. The princes or leaders of Israel. They were all involved. The priests of Israel. The priests would go along with the will of the people and the the people would go along with the priests. It was a nasty cycle that we find in the book of Malachi. Like people, like priests. And the people said, like the priest, so go the people. They got away from the law of God and turned into idolatry and the people followed. It was easy to do. The priests could say, It's not my fault. The people wanted this. Don't we remember that? Even even, uh, Aaron, you know, the people were playing. It was the people that desired a golden calf to be made. And Aaron says, it wasn't me. It It just got here. It just appeared here, washing his hands of it, even though he was the one that created it. So idolatry has run amok. It's been the status quo of the nation of Israel. Verse 7, In thee, I think I'm going to go through like verse 16, I think so. Uh, In thee have they set light by father and mother in the midst of thee. They have dealt by oppression with the stranger. In thee have they vexed the fatherless and the widow. They they dealt with those that, that, that corrupted them. That, that made a mockery of them. They just went with it. Thou hast despised, verse number eight, thou hast despised mine holy things and hast profaned my Sabbaths. Everything they did was against the will of God. In thee are men that carry tales to shed blood And in thee, they eat upon the mountains in the midst of thee. They commit lewdness. Remember, I've been referring to the book of Hosea oftentimes lately. The fact is they were giving credit to Baal. They were giving credit to the pagan gods of the things that God had provided for them. It's the ultimate. That's why God is a jealous God. That's why God sees his people worshiping other things. In thee, verse number 10, in thee have they discovered their father's nakedness. In thee have they humbled her that was was set apart for pollution. And one hath committed abomination with the neighbor's wife, and another hath lewdly defiled his daughter-in-law. And another in thee hath hath humbled his sister, his father's daughter. In thee have, have they taken gifts to shed blood. Thou hast taken taken usury and increase, and thou hast greedily uh, gained of thy neighbors by extortion and hast forgotten me, saith the Lord God. Behold, therefore, I have smitten mine hands at thy dishonest gain which thou hast made and at thy blood which hath been in in the midst of thee. I like that God smites his hands. (laughs) is what they deserve. They deserve my judgment because they have forsaken me. They detest my law. They detest everything I've told them. And of course, we know that God wasn't taken by surprise at all this, was he? This has been history since the beginning of creation, rejecting the word and the will of God. Verse number 14 now. 
Can thine heart endure, or can thine hands be strong in the days that I shall deal with thee? I, the Lord, have spoken it and will do it. And I will scatter thee among the heathen. Did God do that? He did indeed. It's amazing there are those that think that they would take this literally, the scattered the nation among the heathen, but then change those scattered people into the church. They call it covenant theology. They broke their promise. You know, Israel broke their, the covenant with God, so God has taken Israel out of the way, and he's, keeping, and he, he's changed the church into the Israel of God. This is far from true. Very, it's, it's not even close to true. It's totally false. It's abjectly wrong, because when we continue, we see that they're dispersed. Uh, and I will scatter thee among the heathen, and disperse thee in the countries, and will consume thy filthiness out of thee. And thou shalt take thine inheritance in thyself in the sight of the heathen, and thou shalt know that I am the Lord. They would keep their identity wherever they would go. That's what you'd even see in New York City. For the longest time, it probably still does, still has the highest Jewish population in the world. I think it's been surpassed finally by Israel now, but they would keep their identity as being strangers and pilgrims in the lands where they have sent, been sent. That was God's judgment upon them. If we read almost every other prophet, read, the, read all of Isaiah, read, read the rest of Ezekiel, you'll find that he'll gather his people and bring them back into the land. And he will do that when, you know, when, when Jesus Christ returns again. What we see in Israel today is kind of a little foreshadowing, but yet they will have that time of regeneration. It'll be a time of, of uh, refreshing. Peter speaks of in Acts chapter 2. That's when Israel will be saved in that time of refreshing. What that comes upon, upon them. Let's go back to, uh, let's go over to chapter 24 while we're, while we're in Ezekiel. Verse number, now let's go to verse 1. I wanted to get to verse 6. Uh, again, in the ninth year, in the tenth month, in the tenth day of the month, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, write the name of the day, even of the same day the king of Babylon set himself against Jerusalem the same day. And he goes on, or, or said in, verse, in chapter 23, this would be when Jehoiakim was, was the king. His, he would be dragged off into Babylon in, change, in chains. And utter parable, a parable unto the rebellious house, and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, set on a, on a pot, set it on, and also pour water into it. Gather the pieces thereof into it, even every good piece, the thigh and the shoulder, Fill it with, thy, with the choice bones. I'm getting hungry just reading that. I don't know. <laughs> Take the choice of the flock and burn also the bones under it and make it boil well and let them seethe the bones of it therein. Wherefore, thus saith the Lord God, woe to the bloody city, to the pot whose scum is therein and the, whose scum is not gone out of it. Bring it out piece by piece, let no lot fall upon it. He's dealing with the tribulation here. For her blood is in the midst of her. She set it upon the top of a rock. She poured it not upon the ground to cover it with dust, that it might cause fury to come up to take vengeance. I have set her blood upon the top of a rock that it should not be covered." 
Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Woe to the bloody city, I will, make, I will even make the pile for fire great. Heap on wood, kindle the fire, consume the flesh, and spice it well, and let the bones be burned. Then set it empty upon the coals thereof, that the brass of it may be hot and may burn, and that the filthiness of it may be molten in it, that the scum of it may be consumed. She hath wearied herself with lies, and her great scum went not forth out of her. Her scum shall be in the fire. And the filthiness is lewdness, because I have purged thee, and thou wast not purged. Thou shalt not be purged from thy filthiness any more till I have caused my fury to rest upon thee. He's dealing with, with judgment. He's dealing with when, when the Lord comes again. They had set. Notice the, the, the blood on the rock instead of being poured on the ground. The proper way of dealing with blood was not to put it on the rock for a sacrifice. That was the job of the priests. That was the job that Ezekiel had, that, that God showed, put it on, now put it on the rock. They, they worshipped idols. They, they shed blood of, of animals and they made a false sacrifice. I want to see how far I want to go here. Because I want to stay in Ezekiel now too. If, uh, let's uh, verse... Verse 14, I, the Lord, have spoken it. It shall come to pass, and I will do it. I will not go back, neither will I spare, neither will I repent. According to the ways and according to thy doings, shall they, they judge thee, saith the Lord God. The Babylonians will judge them, but the ultimate judgment will be from the Lord as in during the tribulation period. Let's go to one of the place. I haven't figured it out yet, but I will. <laughs> Ezekiel was still in, in Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 38. Now we know the prophecies of happening here, but I want to here I want to skip I want to skip down. We've seen all of the all of the, the promises that they would go into judgment. Look at verse number eight. After many days thou shalt be visited, in the latter years thou shalt come into the land of that is brought back from the sword and is gathered out of many people against the mountains of Israel, which have been always waste. But it is, it is brought forth out of the nations that they shall dwell safely, all of them. So they're going to come back. They're going to be in the land. Let's go a little further down. Uh, Ezekiel 39. Verse number 20. Let's go with, with verse 21. And I will set my glory among the heathen, and all the heathen shall see my judgment that I have executed in my hand that I have laid upon them. So the house of Israel shall know that I am the Lord their God from that day and forward. Now, verse 23, and the, heathen, and the heathen shall know that the house of Israel went into captivity for their iniquity because they trespassed against me. Therefore hid I my face from them and gave them into the land of their, their enemies. So, shall they all by the so, so, so fell they all by the sword. 
According to their uncleanness and according to their transgression have I done unto them and hid my face from them. Therefore, verse 25, thus saith the Lord God, now will I bring again the captivity of Jacob and have mercy upon the whole house of Israel and will be jealous for my holy name. After that, they have borne their shame and all their trespasses, whereby they have trespassed against me when they dwelt safely in their land, and none made them afraid. Whom I have brought them again, when I have brought them again from the people, and gathered them out of their enemies' lands, and am sanctified in them in the sight of many nations. Then shall they know that I am the Lord, Lord their God which caused them to be led into captivity among the heathen. But I have gathered them into their own land and have left none of them any more there. Neither will I hide my face any more from them, for I have poured out my spirit upon the house of Israel, saith the Lord God. So we see... Jerusalem, the city of blood. Judgment came upon Jerusalem, came upon Israel for their, their wickedness and their idolatry that they have had. But yet we see the promise that he's going to bring all of both houses of Israel. I think it's chapter 39 talks about the, the two sticks, the stick of Judah and the stick, stick of Israel being brought together as one. Being back, I got in trouble for saying this one time. I, I called them the United Nation, the United States of Israel. But they will be. Judah and Israel will be together. And, and they will be one in the, in the kingdom to come. Let's go back to Nahum now. All that to say, here's the bloody city, who's the one of idolatry. Does that say 12 o'clock? No. Oh. It's 11. I was like, wow, that went fast. It's like 12 o'clock already. So he said, we see the bloody city. Nineveh would both be the, it would be the same thing. It was the blood of all the shed blood of, of people they conquered, but they would also have the blood of the sacrifice. That's a couple verses down. You'd find their, their idolatry there which is the thing that ultimately would get God to judge them. That's why he didn't, he didn't want his people being among the nations. He wanted the, those people cast out, the Moabites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and, and all those. They were supposed to rid the land of those people because of their idolatry. But what did they do? They didn't obey God. Instead of ridding the land of idolatry, they yoked up with the idols. And hence, they're in the mess that they've been for 2,000 or 3,000 plus years since then. So look at verses, verses 2 and 3 in, in Nahum chapter 3. Oh, we didn't, we didn't finish chat, uh, verse number one, so. Woe to the bloody city. It is all filled full of lies and robbery. Think of this. Malachi 3.10. Well, a man robbed God. They've, uh, they've robbed God of his glory. They've robbed God of everything. They've plundered from all of the nations. And, and receive that instead. It is full of lies and robbery. The prey departeth not. Their plunder was, there was so much of it. We went through that last week. They, they, they had had so much wealth. They didn't know what to do with it. They had so much. They were the mightiest. They were the great city, as Jonah called it, along with Babylon and Jerusalem, which we'll touch on that great city in a few minutes. Verses, uh, verse 2, 
It says the noise of a whip, the noise of the rattling of the wheels. Back there in, in, back in Nahum chapter 2, verse, uh, verse 4, there are those that think this is talking about modern automobiles and modern weapons of war, but we have the sound of the whip and the sound of the chariot. Think of, we have to think in terms of them. What would a huge advancing army with horses and whips and chariots sound like? Remember, it, it scared the king of Nineveh out of a sleep. And he would call his nobles to set up a fortification, which God had told them to do. God dared them. Go ahead. Do the best you can do. Fortify the cities, city because I'm bringing judgment. Remember a few years earlier, King Sen uh, Sennacherib would, would uh, I can't get my words out, uh, would, would be in the face of God, telling King Hezekiah, don't believe, you don't believe that, do you? You don't trust, all the other gods fell against me. You have no reason to believe what Hezekiah says. And yet, it would happen. Nineveh would fall by the wayside, never to rise back into power again. The noise of the whip, the noise of the, the rattling of the wheels and the prancing horses and of the jumping chariots. Why were chariots jumping? You gotta think, you gotta look a couple verses ahead. I have a, I have a brother-in-law that was, that was in the service. He saw combat in Iraq and he could tell you of the jumping trucks that jumped, it, it, Gordon's got it right, you could tell the veterans, you know, jumping over the bodies, the corpses that laid in the street. The prancing horses, what does a prancing horse do? It has to stand up. You know, the, sometimes I've seen, I've seen people say that this is because the prancing horses were, were show horses. Look at my beautiful horse. But they were standing, they were, they were, uh, they were, uh, they were trying to go over the bodies in any way, meanwhile, the chariot wheels were rolling over the, the corpses in the street. So that's what it says here again. He says, the noise of a whip, the noise of the rattling of the wheels and of the prancing horses and of the jumping chariots, the horseman lifteth up both the bright sword and the glittering spear. And we find, we find that, that the Assyrian swords were burned. They were they were, they were taken, they were burned with everything else. The Babylonians obviously had some finely painted, you know, painted red as in chapter 2. Finely painted chariots and, and, uh, and spears and swords that, that they used. And we, we, we see that, how they used that. They just overpowered the Assyrians. The Assyrians, as mighty as they were, were not prepared. After all... They, like other cities, thought they were the greatest in the world. We can't be overtaken. Sounds almost like, almost like where we live today. Nothing can come against America. America the Great. We, we, we're, we can't be, be beaten whatsoever. I think those days have been over for a while. You know, it's sad to say. But this isn't about America. This is about Nineveh. So let's go back to Nineveh. And there was a, um, the horseman lifted up both the bright sword and the glittering spear, and there was a multitude of slain and a great number of carcasses, and there was none end of their corpses. They stumble upon their corpses because of the mul multitude of the... Oh, wait, let me go back to that. Even the ones trying to fight back... They couldn't, stop, they couldn't fight back because of the corpses that, that, that were there. So those in Nineveh, were, they couldn't do anything. They were helpless against the, the Medes slash Babylonians. Verse number four, now here's where we turn again to the, another kind of blood. Verse number four, because of the multitude of the whoredoms of the well-favored harlot. Where else do you find out here about a harlot? 
You find out the Babylonians in Revelation chapter 17 and 18, Jeremiah 50 and 51. By the way, that's, we won't read Jeremiah 50 and 51, but it's the longest prophecy in the entire Bible. It's about the destruction of Babylon. The origin of Nineveh, we've gone through this a couple times in this, was, was through Nimrod. He left Babylon, or went to Babylon, then out of Babylon, went, to, went, out of Shia, uh, went up and, and formed Nineveh. Nineveh was created, came out of Babylon. You know, so, so this old Babylonian worship would be transported to Nineveh. They'd have different names for their gods, much like today there's different names for the Babylonian gods, but they're still the same Babylonian gods. That's why we see the same that's why we see the same imagery of, of a harlot. We see the same imagery of, of uh, female deities through all different cultures. They look different. Yes, there is a Chinese version of Mary, which has another name, etc. But these are all images of Semiramis out of Babylon. They will be, they will be destroyed one day. Uh, so Nineveh is the well-favored harlot. Well-favored. Well-favored by who? If I know the attitude of, of the Assyrians, they were well-favored by them, of themselves. They were endued with all the riches that they had. They had that power. She's the well-favored harlot. The mistress of witchcrafts. She selleth nations through her whoredoms. Sells families through her witchcrafts. They were in the, they were in the, the, uh, the mindset of, of marketing mankind. They would have slavery. They would have everything that you can picture in an evil society. Let's go back to, to Revelation 17. I should say up to Revelation 17. Forward to Revelation 17. I think the parallels are so... Incredible between Nineveh and what takes place in Revelation 17, even though we know that Nineveh is gone by this point. Babylon is not yet. Verse number one of Revelation 17. And there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. Some people say, is that among people or is it among literally waters? My answer is yes. You know, where did Babylon and, and even Nineveh? Babylon sat at the crossroads of, of the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. Babylon had an incredible series of, of canals that interconnected between the two, two, the two rivers. It was a mighty seaport, much like Houston is today. Has anybody ever been to Houston? You know, Houston never was until, until uh, what's the other city? Galveston. Galveston was supposed to be the big city, but they were, they were smart then. We didn't have, we didn't have the, uh, the, federal, the federals and insurance and everything like that. They said, well, we can't. Galveston in 1938 got, got, got buried by a, by a hurricane. And what did they do? They didn't have money, money to rebuild. They said, Let's, I think we ought to move inland. So they created the port of Houston with, a, with an incredible canal that, that connects to the, the, Gulf, the Gulf of Mexico. This is what Babylon was like. A seaport that was rich, that, was, that had everything that could be. Sitteth upon many waters. Now in verse 2, put Nineveh in here for our current, our current discussion with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication 
and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. What's that fornication? That's idolatry. That's, uh, that's everything evil that there is. Which, by the way, is paraded as good nowadays. So he carried me away in the, in the spirit into the, the wilderness. And I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. That sounds like the Catholic Church to me, but was the Catholic Church around when the book of Revelation was written? No. Was Babylon around? Mm-hmm. Big time. It was, a big, it was still a, a big city. It was still, even up in the 1920s, the, the, uh, Babylon had several thousand people, like 20-something thousand people in there. And it very easily could be built up. That's why I take Babylon literal as Babylon, even mystery Babylon, because what's the mystery? The mystery would be all their fornication and all their idolatry that was there. And we did this a couple of years ago on a, on a Wednesday evening, or several Wednesday evenings. We just, as you could do if you have a portal Bible right now, enter Babylon into your search, or, or one of the, you can enter Chaldea or Chaldean in there too, and uh, you'll find 300 or more references to Babylon throughout the scriptures, for good or bad. Then you enter the word Jerusalem, there's over 700 references to Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the most mentioned city in the Bible. The third most mentioned, which, is, which still blows my mind to this day, is Bethlehem. A little tiny city is mentioned more than, other, more than these other cities. You think there was, do you think Bethlehem had biblical importance? Being the house of bread, where Jesus would come from, through, through, uh, through Bethlehem, where David was from? All these different things. Then do this. This will be for, for giggles. Enter Rome into your Bible search. There are nine references to Rome. All of those are in the book, of, most of those, if not all of them, are in, if I recall, are in the book of Romans. Surprise, surprise, surprise! <laughs> so Babylon, by just what the Bible states of it, fulfills all the qualifications to be this, this whore. Nineveh fulfilled it. Jerusalem fulfilled it for a while as well. There are some people that believe the whore of Babylon is, is Jerusalem as well. It's spiritually called Sodom and Gomorrah in the book of Revelation, but not Babylon, even mystery Babylon. You can look that, tell you that all the way back to, back to the, the founding of Babylon and the Babylonian religions. Where were we now? And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Try to name all those harlots that Babylon is the mother of. There's some modern ones today. There's religious movements that have taken place throughout the world and throughout the history. These are all mothers of harlots. I used to have a, I mean the daughters of the, the harlot. I used to have a pa pastor that he was a diehard Baptist. So, yep, even, the, even all the Protestants, those are members of the harlot. Some are, I'd agree. But he'd say Baptists are totally separate, which I totally disagree with. You know who's separate? Those who have trusted the Lord Jesus Christ. Separate from all this. Verse number six, again, have eyes of Nineveh here for a second. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. 
Where, where, where are these martyrs of Jesus? You find these all in the book of Revelation. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're in the book of Revelation. Uh, here, this is uh, uh, not something that's taken place throughout all, all, of the, all of history. This is specific to the book of Revelation. It was Babylon that this, this whore is drunk with the blood of the saints. This whore would persecute. And, and uh, in Revelation 12, you know, God would hide them, hide the, the, the woman that has the child in a hiding place which we look at as being Petra or Basra, the sheepfold. And the angel said unto me, yeah, and I saw the woman drunken with the blood of saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. And the angel said unto me, Wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her, which hath the, the seven heads and ten horns. I'm going to leave it right there. That's a whole, that's a whole nother uh, thing. But let's turn to the book of Zechariah. I always have fun with this. The book of Zechariah. Chapter number five. Kathy and Gordon, you guys are familiar with this with your friend that believed there was a tuna roll that was here, but <laughs> in a missile, Zechariah chapter chapter five. This is a this is I think the the proof that the mystery, the, the woman that rides on that beast is Babylon. Zechariah chapter 5. Then I turned and lifted up mine eyes and looked, and behold, a flying roll. This was true. We actually know somebody that said a roll, kind of like a, a tuna roll. What is a tuna roll shaped like? It's shaped like a missile. They saw a missile. But a roll, some of you might have a, a Bible that says a scroll, which, which fits well because what do you do with a scroll? You roll the scroll. That sounded like an, a rhyme there. Going to roll the scroll. Amy, maybe you can write a song about rolling the scroll. I'll get right on. There we go. You can jump on that. So, going to roll the scroll. So it was, a, it was a, a scroll. And I turned and lifted up mine eyes and, and looked, and behold, a flying roll. And he, and he said unto me, What seest thou? And I answered, I see a flying roll. The length thereof is 20 cubits, and the breadth thereof, ten cubits. Then say, said he unto me, This is the curse that goeth forth over the face of the whole earth. For everyone that, that stealeth shall be cut off as on this side according to it. And everyone that sweareth shall be cut off as, as on that side according to it. The... I agree with the common consensus that this roll had was a picture of the the Ten Commandments. The five that were direct on one side were the five horizontal commandments, and the five on the other side were the the five vertical commandments dealing with God. So this is the law. This is the, the picture of the curse. Anybody that doesn't doesn't go for this law, it's a curse. You can't obey the law. You could be blameless before the law. The Apostle Paul was regarding the Jews' religion. He was blameless according to the law. In other words, he sinned, but he knew what to do when he, when he sinned. There was, there, was, there was a way through the law, even for the person that didn't have the financial means to bring a perfect sacrifice that they needed to bring, but it, they were able to do so could bring a turtle dove instead of a lamb, etc. All these different things. So we have this, this scroll, verse number three. 
No, verse number four, I will bring it forth, saith the Lord of hosts, and it shall enter in the house of the thief and into the house of him that sweareth falsely by my name, and it shall remain in the midst of his house. So it's going to go. It's going to, it's going to devastate the, the person who swears falsely and the thief. And it shall remain in the midst of his house and shall consume it with the timber thereof and the stones thereof. So this, this, this curse will come in into the house of the thief and the one that sweareth falsely, and they'll be condemned by that curse. That house will be ridden of. Verse number five, Then the angel that talked with me went forth and said unto me, Lift now thine eyes and see what is this that goeth forth. And I said, What is it? And he said, This is an ephah that goeth forth. It's a basket. Try to picture that, a basket that's going forth. And he cast the weight of lead upon the mouth thereof. This must be some strong basket to have a, a weight of lead to seal up the top hole of it. All I can think of is the, the old uh, images of the snake charmers. You know, and, and the snake comes out of the top of the basket. To keep that snake in, you need a, a weight on the top. But he has a weight of lead. Why would they need a weight of lead on a basket? Well, let's go on. It's, it's pretty self-explanatory. And he said, this is wickedness. This, this, the basket's wickedness. And he cast it into the midst of, oh, wait a minute, I missed it. And, and behold, there was lifted up a talent of lead, and this is a woman that sitteth in the midst of the ephah. So they have the lead, look down, there's a woman in there. Naturally, what do you do when you see a woman in a basket? You throw the lead on top so she doesn't get out. Right? And it says, yeah, do not try this at home, you'll be in trouble. <laughs> I'll go back into your basket. Uh, <laughs> but we, we get this picture here of this woman. It's the same woman who rides the beast. Yeah, you know, this is a beast that that or or two beasts that she'll take a ride with. And again, strong beasts here coming up. And he said, This is wickedness, and he cast it into the midst of the ephah, and he cast the weight of lead upon the mouth thereof. So again, I look, this is a pretty strong angel that has the woman and has the lead through the woman and through the lead on top to make sure she doesn't get out. There's no escape for this woman. It's not her time. Then, verse 9, Then lifted up mine eyes and looked, and behold, there came out two women, and the wind was in their wings, for they had wings like the wings of a stork, and they lifted up the ephah between the earth and the heaven. Now, I have to be honest, I haven't figured out exactly who these two women are here that carry, the, carry this leaded woman in a basket, but I know where they're going to. They lifted up the ephah between the earth and the heaven, and said I to the angel that talked with me, whither, whither do these bear the ephah? And he said unto me, to build it a house in the land of Shinar. Well, where in Shinar? Yeah, Babylon, there we go. To, in the land of Shinar. And it shall be established and set there upon her own base. Have you ever seen like big idols someplace? They have a, like, think of the Statue of Liberty. It's on a base, like a pyramid shaped base with the top of it cut off. It's on there to elevate that. So this woman is put in her own place 
in Babylon. And that's where she's going to end up being back in, during the end times. There will be an end times revival of idolatry. Oh, all the things you hear, people looking for revival everywhere. Looking for revival. I don't think we're going to have a, a true revival, but there's going to be a lot of false ecumenical revivals. And all those revivals will come under the guise of this woman which I believe is, is a representation of Semiramis. This woman being there, gather all the religions together and be made to worship there in Babylon. It's happening today. Look around you. Look at, look at churches that are, are yoked together with, with Mormons and Mormons with this, and, and everybody is, is, is looking for the same thing tied together through mutual experiences that aren't biblical mutual goals of you know building the kingdom etc they're they're mutual they're together and yet and yet it's the word i'm looking for i i think two things at once i used to be able to do that i can't get two thoughts out at once now but uh but you see, well, oftentimes, like you said, history says the woman that rides the beast, that's the Catholic Church, that's Mary. But Mary's only another image of a previous God. And there are those previous gods throughout, or goddesses throughout history, they'll come together. And this will be the Antichrist mystery religion, the unified religion of the world. New age, old age, whatever age it may be, they'll come together. But there is hope. We'll end there. And, oh, well, we, we, got, we got into chapter, uh, chapter 4, uh, or verse number 4. We'll pick it up next week. The reality, I'm, I'm going to sneak ahead to, to, to Revelation 21 for a second in closing. This is going to be my closing of the entire thing, but I'll have to close again with it. As I said, the city of Jerusalem is called the bloody city. It's called the great city. Revelation 21, verse number 10. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city. Is that, you, you, I get, the, I get the, the goosebumps or whatever when I see that. Showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of the heaven of God. How all things will come together. The judgment of Babylon in Revelation 18, the establishment of the millennium in chapters 19, 20, and 21, culminating in the new Jerusalem, coming out of heaven with God. And you and I can take part in that new Jerusalem. That's a neat thing. I'm still not clear about what we'll do with the, in the millennial kingdom. I like to think we'll be doing some super duper things, but I don't know. But one, I, one thing I do know is that the things in heaven and things in earth will, be, will come together and will be in that eternal city. You ready for that? If you're ready, say amen. <laughs> amen. But first, for us, the next thing on the docket that can happen at any time is the rapture of the church. And, and I'm looking forward to taking that flight. It's a lot quicker than JetBlue. <laughs> Amen. To be in the presence of the Lord. To be with Him. To be seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Any second now. I'm waiting. And if it's not any second now, it'll be any second, whenever that second may be. 
Amen? And then, when this new Jerusalem comes down, that'll be the, at the end of the seven years of tribulation. That's when you see all those the martyrs, you'll see the Antichrist going through, used by God at the same time, but rebels against God and he's wiped out by God and his army, the army of one, the brightness of his coming. That's amazing. So we have a, a kingdom. We have Nineveh with the kings of Assyria that thought they were unstoppable. We'll have Babylon in the reign of Antichrist who will think that he's unstoppable. But yet, in both cases, God stops them in their tracks. Amen? It's good. I'm glad I went in a different direction than I was planning, but it's, it works out. I'm looking forward to just that day, whenever it may be, that moment, whenever it may be. Amen?